All right. I think we are ready to get started. So welcome everybody. It's uh, very good to be with you all today. I'm excited to be here. My name is M Adams. M, just the letter, people always ask me that, <laughs> but it's just the letter, M Adams. I use any and all pronouns. Uh, so that means you can refer to me as she and her, he and him, they and them, all of those feel good, fine, and affirming to me. So thank you all who've joined us. Welcome to this uh, session six of Democratic Socialism and Global Perspective, an international conference organized by the Transnational Institute and the Havens Wright Center for Social Justice. And so I'm very, very pleased to be your moderator today. I'm very honored and actually really excited to be able to participate uh, as a listener, just to absorb and soak up what these uh, fresh panelists are gonna offer us. Um, I'm very, a big thank you to La, uh, Layla, Isabel and Liz for providing translation throughout the conference. Shout out, um, language justice is really important to us. So a big thank you, big gratitude to you all for making it possible for more people to participate. So now let's dig into it. This session is titled, From the Streets to the State and Back Again, Social Movements and Democratic Socialism. I'm very excited by the group of people. Sorry about that. I'm very excited by the group of people whom we've brought together for this panel. I'll introduce each speaker in more detail before they speak. But for now, I do wanna mention who they are and welcome them to this discussion. So the panelists are Barbara Ransby from the United States, Gonzalo Beron from Brazil, Agnes Gaggi from, Hung from Hungary, Francis Fox Piven from the United States. Before providing a fuller introduction, I'd like to go over the format briefly. Each panelist will be given around 20 minutes, after which, We'll have about an hour or so for a discussion. You can share your questions throughout the session via the Q and A button in the Zoom panel at the bottom of the screen. Feel free to message in the chat. But if you have a question for the panelists, please, please, please make sure to put it in the Q and A box in the Zoom control panel. I will also invite questions and contributions from other conference panelists who will be speaking at other parts of the conference. So I ask you all to be prepared when the panelists have finished speaking. With that, I'd like to introduce our very first speaker, uh, the one and only Barbara Ransby. Yes, yes it is. <laughs> oh, <Barbara. laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Um, well, I'm really happy to be uh, on this uh, panel and a part of this program. I mean, if ever uh, people concerned with the ravages of capitalism and uh, envisioning a socialist alternative need to come together um, across boundaries and borders, uh, it is now. So um, I wanna thank Patrick Barrett for, um, for inviting me. Um, and I also have an apology to make at the outset, which is we had a scheduling confusion and um, I cannot stay for the entire panel because I actually have to be at another panel, not another place, I'll be sitting in the very same space, but. Uh, but I have to be at another panel um, uh, before this one ends. So I apologize ahead of time. But I'm very happy and I, I look forward to hearing the recordings of uh, Gonzalo and Agnes and Francis's uh, presentations. And of course, anytime uh, M. Adams is uh, in a conversation, it is an important one. And I'm uh, always honored uh, to be in their presence and, and to claim them as a comrade. So I wanna say, I wanna talk about three things. I wanna talk a little bit about racial capitalism and why uh, those of us in the movement for black lives and, and, and black leftists doing work in this period use that term um, and why others should too. Uh, I wanna talk about the current crisis uh, that we find ourselves in and then make a case for the importance um, of radical black leadership uh, going forward. And it's, it's something I think that you know, uh, many of our comrades on the left in the United States really have to wrestle with and, and, and take a good look in the mirror around because if we don't do that, if the predominantly white left does not do that, you know, I really fear the limitations of the kind of movement that we can build. Um, 
So to start, I just like to start by saying a little bit about myself, because I think we bring who we are to these um, ideas. The ideas don't just exist, um, you know, in another place. They emerge from the conditions of our lives. So I grew up in a Black working class community in Detroit. My parents were sharecroppers and farmers and maids um, and, and uh, factory workers. Um, grew up in Detroit. And um, the 1967 Detroit Rebellion was, I think, my first um, really conscious political experience. And um, in that context, I asked a lot of questions uh, that I continue to ask to this day about uh, racism and white supremacy and state power um, and poverty and, and how those all fit together. They also fit together in my parents' lives. Uh, people who were the most you know, generous people uh, I could imagine, but who had very little and who essentially died penniless. Um, and, and so, you know, on a very personal level, I've always asked the question, you know, how do we build a system in a society that allows that to be the common experience of so many poor uh, and working class uh, people, um, black people and brown people in particular. So that's the kind of personal story that I bring to this work. And I have been an activist and a leftist for, uh, and a socialist for 40 years, 40 plus years. I see that as not just uh, a part of a US praxis, but also a part of um, an international and transnational commitment uh, from my work on South Africa and the anti-apartheid movement to my solidarity with the Palestinian people. Um, an internationalist frame has always been very important to me, which is why this is such an honor to be in this conversation. So let me just say a few words about racial capitalism. Now, my dear friend, Robin Kelly, uh, who um, has written about uh, black communists in Alabama and black working class urban experiences in California, et cetera. You know, he always says it's redundant to say racial capitalism because um, you know, they're symbiotic. That race and white supremacy are the cornerstones uh, of, of, of global capitalism in this modern era. And, uh, you know, and, and you know, in some ways it's redundant to say racial capitalism, but we say racial capitalism because a lot of people who critique capitalism um, fail to include that in the analysis. And from my vantage point, you know, the sort of dual pillars of American capitalism in the US, you know, were the uh, dispossession of indigenous land and the theft of black labor and black bodies. Uh, that fueled the growth of capitalism in the United States. And um, the ideology that justified, emboldened, facilitated, enabled that growth uh, was white supremacy uh, unequivocally. And of course, globally, you know, the, the, the rise of global capitalism has rested upon um, colonialism and empire, um, overwhelmingly darker people in the global South colonized uh, um, by European nations uh, under the guise of, of a, you know, a sort of white supremacist global lens. So, so those are critical variables. And I think, you know, Edward Baptiste's work and Walter Johnson's work have documented uh, how race and capitalism are so intimately connected in this country as if we need more documentation. But the term racial capitalism itself, of course, comes, you know, has two origins, comes out of the South African struggle, very tied to, a, you know, a left movement in that country um, and, and a critique of the apartheid regime and also comes out of the work of my uh, friend and colleague, the late Cedric Robinson, who wrote, you know, his uh, tome Black Marxism in which he talks about uh, racialization, the process of racializing people as even predating, uh, uh, predating capitalism and setting the stage uh, for the emergence of capitalism. And so, so to me, to leave out the, 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 the term racial when we talk about capitalism is allow, allows us a certain fiction about both the origins and continued realities uh, of capitalism. Now, the current crisis. I mean, you know, we are facing a conjuncture a moment of conjuncture of crises, multiple crises coming together. Obviously, the COVID pandemic, uh, the, the crisis of, of racist state violence against Black communities that has escalated in this country and has met with unprecedented resistance, unprecedented resistance. Millions of people in this country, under the leadership 
of the Movement for Black Lives. Now, Movement for Black Lives didn't organize all of those spontaneous protests, but since the murder of Mike Brown in Ferguson, Missouri in 2014, and even before that, Trayvon Martin uh, in Florida, two unarmed black uh, young men, this movement has grown, has grown under the leadership of black feminist and queer uh, activists, has grown with a intersectional radical analysis and has grown with a strong, strong emphasis on the black poor and working class. And that's really you know, a, a central point I think for the left to recognize is that the movement for black lives has been a working class struggle. And it's only when we uh, see the working class you know, as, as a white working class that we fail to see that because the movement has indeed uh, prioritized those people that 21st century late capitalism would just as soon imprison uh, or discard that has deemed uh, surplus uh, and superfluous. So it is the focus on particular folks, folks in the informal economy, folks who have you know, been at the, the lower end of the labor hierarchy, if at all. Um, those people have been the people who have been the targets of police violence and the people who this movement has held up uh, and, and, and placed at the center. Now, this iteration of the Black Freedom Movement has been very explicit about a critique of capitalism, has been very explicit uh, about ne the need to be radically inclusive, uh, rejecting the kind of politics of respectability that dominated 20th century uh, Black freedom politics it is a major, a major uh, shift. Um, the, 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 the leadership in particular, people like M. Adams and Denjiwe McCarris and Charlene Carruthers um, and others, you know, represent a real challenge and represent a kind of radical vision that the, that the, the global left movement uh, can, can learn from in all of its uh, diversity and complexity. So, um, you know, so I want to underscore that it often falls off the map and gets reduced to, um, you know, identity politics, but that's because people aren't listening to what these voices are saying. They're not reading the documents that are being uh, produced. Um, et cetera. The Vision for Black Lives document, which originally was produced in 2016, really should have been a manifesto for the left in general. It addressed issues ranging from climate change uh, to, to labor rights, um, but it put at the center the brutality of a system that is prepared to destroy, surveil, cage people who no longer fit you know, in the, um, in the current uh, economic uh, paradigm. In my read of this moment is that capitalism itself is in a major crisis uh, from the financialization of capital to um, the sort of robotization of large industries and um, rendering your workers like my, you know, people who would be doing the kind of jobs my dad did uh, in Detroit, you know, they're basically being displaced. Uh, and climate, you know, as Bill McKibben has said, capitalism uh, has an infinite growth strategy on a finite planet. And so all of these contradictions and tensions uh, come to bear. These are the key, key issues that some of the black left organizers that I've had the privilege to work with have been addressing. And so I, you know, centering that, centering the folks who have been um, at the forefront of one of the most sustained and militant uh, working class uprisings in this country's history, um, I think is, you know, is really required of us. And so hopefully we can look forward to expanded um, uh, conversations in the future. I really regret that I can't stay longer because I would love uh, people's responses to some of the things um, that I've raised. What we've seen in the U.S. Capitol, you know, on January 6th, um, there's many, many debates um, about what to call it. I think we've landed on a white nationalist uh, attempted coup. It was a ragtag uh, bunch and, 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 and didn't have the military behind it. But there were a group of very serious organized uh, uh, people in that group. And I think what it represents is a kind of culmination of a white nationalist agenda, even though some of those groups actually have people of color in them, but a white nationalist agenda as a strategy and an offering for attempting to save racial capitalism. And what we have to offer as a socialist movement um, is a visionary alternative uh, and, uh, and a campaign and a movement and movements of solidarity uh, that defy the fear 
uh, that, that fascists have always uh, tried to use against our movement. So I think I'll stop there. I'm probably at my 20 minutes, M. Um, you'll let me know if I'm not. Of course, I could go on, um, but I think I'll stop there. I mean, I'm, I'm over here taking notes. Uh, and so it's always uh, an honor and a pleasure to hear from you, Barbara, as you challenge us, as you keep us accountable uh, to centering a racial analysis and how we understand capitalism and build power. Um, and so thank you very much for those remarks. And so now we will go to our second panelist. So joining us now, we'll be moving to Gonzalo. Sorry about that. Um, Gonzalo is a Transnational Institute Associate Fellow. He has been active in international mobilizations against different expressions of the corporate agenda as part of trade union organizations, as well as other civil society networks and campaigns in Latin America. In 2012, Gonzalo helped launch the global campaign to reclaim people's sovereignty, dismantle corporate power, and stop impunity. Through Argentinian, though Argentinian, he has been based in Brazil for many years. So Gonzalo, we'll kick it to you. Yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for inviting me to, to be part of this uh, panel. Thank you, Daniel, and, and the whole project, um, and my colleagues of TNI and, and others. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here and to share with you some of our experience. Um, mostly in Brazil, I will try to focus on that uh, with the following the idea of, of um, a kind of a case, uh, but it's a relevant case indeed, uh, to study and to analyze and to see what's going on in relation to the, to the future. I will switch into Spanish because I was planned to speak in Spanish, sorry. <laughs> um, entonces, um, okay. lo que voy a contar es un poco so el análisis sobre la, la, la realidad y lo que about pasa the reality in Brazil. Today. I remember that a few years ago, Daniel called me to a conference in Montevideo, Uruguay, and I raised the idea of cycles that were closing and opening in the Brazilian political sphere. Then, it was approximately at the end of 2013, uh, it was a moment of great uprisings, popular uprisings, in the streets against Dilma, which is the second to last government of PT. And it seemed to be the beginning of the end of a cycle, a long cycle that connected strongly social movements with political parties and with ideas of socialism. I want to incorporate into my argument an important question, an epistemological question. Is it socialism or not? The ideas of socialism are, have to be constructed in concrete terms. That's why socialism is always in dispute. We obey to concrete material realities. And why do I say this? Each one of these cycles that is tied to social realities with the construction of ideas of political projects are fundamental for understanding why we struggle, how we struggle. I think that's more useful, and I say this with complete respect towards more orthodox constructions of analysis. Um, of um, classical Marxism. Pero bueno, digo esto observando but sobre I todo say la this ¿no? observing este the Brazilian reality. Acabe, this a, century, a, a oh, this cycle eh, that we closed Daniel, out, Montevideo, which I mentioned to eh, in Montevideo, eh, está cerrado. En aquel entonces, has now closed. No, eh, teníamos claridad Back then, de hacia we didn't have clarity abrir, uh, eh, regarding where we were going or when it was going to reopen. Now, we have some more clarity, and I want to speak about this. Uh, this panel is called Towards the Construction of the State to the Streets and Back. So it's spot on. 
and we are talking about eh, subjects, esperanza, political menos, agents eh, that give us potencia, great ¿no? hope. Eh, ese ciclo que yo digo que se, that se cierra, cycle eh, si that del, de la, closed de la, de la de su realidad, from so, an analysis of, of, of rooted in the social analysis de, eh, is the collection al, al that gave birth to eh, PT, una, una to the Workers' Party. And it's the conclusion eh, of a movement de pastorales sociales vinculado of a la Iglesia Católica, muy fuerte pastorales, so, uh, social todavía, pastorales es, es un, of the uh, church. Habrán escuchado que era una agenda And maybe política you heard de, that de it was a political sector, agenda eh, of that sector, of the religious y, sector, y which was ample and popular, deeply rooted in Brazilian society. Um, and la which otra parte, la otra parte contributed to the National Workers' Center. I would also like más, to talk más, about más unions, todo, classical, classic unions, ABC, del, uh, for example, the unions of ABC, de which Paulo is the otras, industrial eh, belt of Sao Paulo, sector, and a third eh, sector, eh, el de which is the sector of intellectual and political elites, <laughs> which is to say acá. us, many of who are here eh, today. Ese, esa eh, that ese social, cual después, social se movement with these three elements, eh, campo, along forman, with eh, campesino eh, movements, together un, construct un, un, una que es el PT, a political eh, tool, tool which is the PT, the Workers' Party. Uh, as you may have heard, bloque, eh, um, many others later joined the PT, eh, but they constructed de, de collectively a set of ideals and proposals based on their historic experiences. De directo, uh, for example, the eh, um, reconstitution eh, of democracy in Brazil eh, after the ideas, dictatorship. Eh, These were proposals, values, forma, principles, eh, politics, that were discussed along the, throughout the decades of the 80s and 90s and through concessions, of course, but became uh, a strong left alternative that arrived to power. So that package of ideals was consolidated and it matured in the early 2000s in the PT government and the administration. So maybe someone might say, oh, it's in the DNA of PT, especially because unions are so important to PT, negotiations are in the DNA of the party. So maybe eh, la, with that idiosyncrasy gobierno, of negotiations, eh, okay, uh, Social digno, Democratic algunos, Party más o menos was digno born. Para uno, para Some otro. might say it's more dignified eh, than others. Pero bueno, ese fue el, el, el ciclo de, de maduración but y, overall, y de, I would apogeo, call that period tiempo, the, eh, PT, the period of maturity of PT de ese, de ese and the implementation of that political eh, eh, project. Desde el Estado, from the state. That period generated new contradictions. And those contradictions were born from a very strong critique that was made to its values. The radicalization of the right has, of course, characteristics, global characteristics, but also local characteristics. There's a lot of class resentment of the elite um, towards even the middle class. And they are, a, so these contradictions are a product of this moment of PT maturity of uh, churches from the base, of movements uh, um, from agriculture, campesinos. So we have these contradictions. The attack that is produced against PT has two stems. One is constitutional, of course, the coup that we saw 
Dilma Rousseff, uh, that uh, was la, done against la, uh, Dilma Rousseff, but then the judicial persecution to everyone and anyone who was associated to PT and the government General, there was a demonization through social media, through newspapers and hegemonic media, and it was the creation of an anti movement. And they had, I, I really want to highlight this, they had important results. It wasn't just the change of powers, uh, eh, through the eh, impeachment. Uh, it wasn't just the instability medio, of the Temer eh, government for eh, two years. La, la, la and por poco, pero of la course, fin, the elections eh, that happened Bolsonaro, hardly happened, but did happen, que, that el resulted in Bolsonaro. But importantly, antipetismo now has a strong manifestation that imposes itself and holds a grip culturally on public opinion, on the youth. And we see that in the most recent elections, local elections, in which the figure of Lula, which was still uh, functioning collectively in the, in the collective imaginary as a salvation, um, was suddenly hidden from the elections. Nobody wanted to sit next to uh, a flyer or a poster that had Lula because that uh, scared voters away. And that's a dynamic that we really hadn't seen until these most recent municipal elections. There was, yes, a generational shift. Todo el martilleo, um, digamos, el, el golpe, te, el golpe the, constante the eh, mediático contra el PT attacks on PT and its main figures really had an impact on society. And also in the left, it's not just that the attacks uh, were had impacts on the right. And overall, what we saw was a rejection eh, Lula, to PT from Esto, public entonces, opinion. So, despite that the party has eh, a strong base, a representative eh, una, base across eh, Brazil, de un, de un horizonte. Eh, de, de, there is a shift in the horizon and of what is possible. Es que representantes o candidatos fact, en las elecciones locales, candidates eh, in the local eh, elections que eran inclusive del propio Partido de los Trabajadores, no part escondían of PT, al, al Partido de los Trabajadores. Escondían, tried to hide porque ellos sabían, their PT saben, que en la población, eh, cuando uno se presenta como del PT, tiene que remontar them. la, when la pesada herencia when they presented themselves eh, as que, PT candidates, o si they were to have done that, they would eh, have had to defend themselves. Esto es una realidad. Eh. Esto es una realidad, of, uh, pero es una realidad que está enraizada and that's a reality. una transformación de la sociedad brasileña. Entonces, of por el quinto motivo, los, los movimientos sociales que posibilitaron la construcción de este bloque so these are the con this is the context that created uh, these different manifestations and contradictions. Another one is the union crisis, the crisis of the labor movement. There was a law recently passed two years ago that transformed um, labor. It was a labor reform. And it destroyed unionism in its normative sense. Uh, of course, it was a labor movement that had already been suffering great blows that had been definanced. And that was extremely weak. The same thing happened with the Catholic Church. Interestingly, 
por otro, por otro gran, por otro gran cambio en sus territorios y sus antiguas bases por otras razones, que es la emergencia de la Iglesia Evangélica Protestante. De Entonces, la Iglesia Católica está retirada de las bases donde está, se puede cumplir en muchos lugares, en muchas localidades de Brasil, y esa función social ahora es ocupada eh, and the function that it played in the past has now, is now being played un, by this de, Protestant de valores, evangelical church, de, eh, which of course has very different values eh, and practices. No la de un it ideal de benefits sino de un ideal de salvación propia, de autorización y tal, que empalma más con las ideologías uh, de la an ideology y no that aligns itself much more Eso with the ha sido right. eh, fundamental. So that has de decir been también que en términos de, de, de transformaciones sociales, una Lastly, otra gran transformación social, another great social transformation, es que de esas, de a product que of all these changes de, de that I've mentioned today, eh, del PT, regarding the implementation la propia base of the project rural of PT, PT is the rural base Entonces, of PT. Tenemos a un It has MST, also disappeared. Eh, PT eh, has eh, therefore been está weakened al mismo tiempo que, porque se acostumbró because it became la accustomed eh, PT, to pero también porque hay una transformación eh, empresarial eh, del campo. The agricultural el, el, el population got hoy, accustomed eh, to the policies poderoso, of PT eh, and became weakened eh, when the Entonces, latter estos was cambios hacen que el So these are the changes that we have to contend with in Brazil. The social PT, changes PT, that eh, led eh, to PT and that are today in Pero crisis. Eso no Suerte, But that's no not todo, ¿no? all, Porque fortunately, that is not hoy, all, eh, because today we have the need and the de, de beginning of a renovation. There are signs, indications that there is eh, a new en, transformation, en and mm -hmm. I consider myself quite optimistic in that regard. En, en Brasil, o, o, However, o, socialism o, will be constructed in Brazil with possibly some new ideas of a new socialism as has been presented in this session. We know that they will have to contend with new actors, powerful actors. So I agree with the comrade that presented eh, prior to me, Barbara Renzi, no no it's re the eh, new subjects are not people like us, university, no. white intellectuals. It's also eh, not necessarily unionists. Este, rurales, it's also not necessarily Católica. the Catholic Hoy, Church or campesinos. Las personas, Today, eh, los líderes, the candidates. Las, las líderes, eh, que brillan, the que women leaders pasada, that shine. Eh, trajo, son personas ligadas a la lucha eh, eh, por reivindicación de la población municipal negra. elecciones eh, are primarily mujeres, from eh, the black de community, son los más castigados por el, por el modelo económico black women. brasilero, ¿no? la población negra que es casi el 50% the black population, de nuestra, which is approximately eh, de nuestra población, 50% eh, of the es, eh, Brazilian population es la más pobre, es la más castigada por la violencia poorest, policial eh, y la más excluida. Entonces, es obvio que de alguna forma excluded. el discurso so, de reivindicación del pueblo eh, y la de la población negra de empieza finalmente, incluso por algunas eh, tendencias globales, pero con una, con una larga tradición eh, de lucha global en, struggles, en el Brasil. Y son esos. Estas elecciones a nivel liberation. local son las elecciones en las cuales se han elegido the más concejalas the local eh, negras, elections that we recently eh, had have been the ones with the greatest black representation. Eh, In the past, eh, there's been some eh, entonces, esto es un, esto, eso black es un gran leaders cambio, and women, son, but es un not que at una this potencia. scale. And eh, we mí, have to recognize this change yo, as de, de a ese, promise for potential. It, this is just the beginning of the change. Of course, there is a reloaded feminist movement. It's a third or fourth wave 
que lo explique mejor. I, eh, I'll let the feminists onda explain that to us, but it's a new wave of feminism aguerrido, that is combative, eh, mucha militant, energetic, and has a lot of ¿no? potential. Entonces, and we saw their force in the elections. Después, and this is the last thing I will say. They have channel, channelized their energy into the elections. They have fought against the machismo, the patriarchy in the elections. And they have constructed their policies in this electoral realm. Many from Sao Paulo, PSOL elected four women and one man. So y that should give you an idea. And one last thing, an important de, change eh, to note, which is the incorporation of eh, leaders, no women no negra, no and men mujeres, and non-binary eh, eh, from LGBT, the countryside no? and from the cities eh, opciones, who are eh, members of the LGBTQ community. Many trans candidates votadas, eh? who are among eh, the most es popular candidates es received the eh, highest number of votes. And I think that that should signal clase, that, that we are at the beginning pregunta, of a new eh, politics. I think a question eh, that everybody uno, is asking themselves and who I, well, I have asked myself this question too, and we should discuss it with intersectionality at its heart. The question is, and it may not be present in um, a socialism that is autonomous, but the ideas today that are hegemonic in the left are the ones that are centered in racial justice, in feminism, in all candidates, in all people who have different and diverse identities and sexual orientation. That is our vanguard. That is the construction of a new left. And we'll see a combination of these new flags, which have the most energy. The youth has always been injecting new blood and energy into the left. They are present and they have so much potential. So we have PESOL, which is a relatively new party. It's the party for socialism and liberation. Uh, we see Guillermo Bolos, who, who knows, could be a new Lula. He is so intelligent and strategic, despite being loved by Lula and loving Lula, he knew that he had to separate from Lula and partake in the creation of a new politics. So those are just some key words, terms, concepts to think and rethink the construction of socialism in Brazil. And, of course, the Brazilian reality should dialogue permanently with other realities. I will close on this point. Entre One la point of intersection of class struggle is, of course, the intersection of black working class Brazilians. The black I've always thought, as have others, that as soon as we have a black working class leadership, we will have emancipation, not just of the black community, but of all Brazilians. Thank you. I am pumped up. I hope you all listening um, are just as pumped up and excited as I am. Uh, this panel has been very full and exciting for me so far, so be sure to chat your comments, your thoughts and ideas in the chat and definitely drop in your questions in the Q&A portion of it. And so we're gonna keep moving with our panel. Our next speaker is Agnes Gaggi. Agnes is a sociologist working on East European politics and social movements from the perspective of the region's long-term global integration. 
She is a co-founder of the Working Group for Public Sociology, Helzet, and the Solidarity Economy Center in Budapest. She is the co-editor of a forthcoming collective volume, Eastern, Europe, Eastern Europe After 30 Years of Transition, New Left Perspectives from the Region. And so Agnes will pass it over to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Em. Thank you everyone for uh, being able to listen to your perspectives here. It's been very inspiring. Um, I thought I would speak about uh, how the streets and the state are not the whole field of the struggle, which might not be exactly why I was invited here. Uh, I didn't get a <laughs> clear message about what I should speak about. So I thought I would bring these up because these have, uh, thoughts have been piling up uh, in the last few years uh, while I have been uh, following uh, the Western part of New Left debates. Um, what I want to say uh, starts from the same approach that was referred by so many panelists before me, uh, which is you know, this uh, classic Marxist insight that uh, capitalism is not the, only the rule of the rich, uh, it's a totality of social relations. Um, meaning things like labor separation from the means of production and meaning also survival, uh, racialization, racial violence as a means of accumulation and control, or the institutionalization of value exchange through the monetary system, or the institutionalization of social imagination through the industrialization of culture and so on. Um, and why I bring this up is because uh, if we follow this train of thought, uh, then anti-capitalist resistance uh, is not external to this, uh, but it is this totality of social relations that includes the contradictions of uh, capitalist growth, uh, not only in the sense that these contradictions are going to appear as conflicts within the social body, like conflicts between the oppressed and the elite, uh, but also in the sense that um, the ways capitalist reorganization recur recurrently tackles the problems of capitalist growth, it also happens within the social body. Uh, and this also means that those positions from which uh, the tensions following from capitalist contradictions are articulated, they are also part of systemic dynamics, uh, because of which they are also tied to interests uh, based in their systemic positions. And because of which uh, there is this temporal uh, aspect uh, of anti-systemic struggle, which means that it doesn't stop at the moment when, when you know, there is a mobilization and the anti-systemic aims are uh, declared, uh, but they are part of a reorganization in time, which is a systemic reorganization of capitalist contradictions. Now, all of this is completely commonplace uh, in the left tradition that uh, you guys also come from, so sorry for reiterating it, but it has some consequences that I would like to highlight because uh, it seems to me that they have been less considered in recent debates about left politics as democratic socialism uh, in Western debates. Um, and I would just bring up four of those. One of them is that um, the way capitalist crisis is conceptualized has been, as I see, too much, con uh, too much conceived uh, with a focus on the decline of uh, Western core democracies and Western welfare within that, and the disillusionment of, of downwardly mobile within uh, middle classes uh, within that. And why this might be a problem is that um, the disillusionment uh, that is the cause of, uh, that uh, goes with the, with the, this uh, downward mobility and the claims following from loss, those losses are not necessarily in line with the requirements of an anti-systemic transformation. Uh, just to bring up one uh, practical consequence of uh, uh, this gap, uh, is that in debates around the Green New Deal, uh, people speak about a green socialist economic revival. Uh, there is a talk about reindustrialization, uh, creating new stable well-paid jobs uh, and so on, uh, which very much go 
in sort of a rhetoric that's, that seems to promise that those positions that people are losing are going to be maintained and restored. And this sort of contradicts the actual need for sharply reducing uh, the levels of consumption, both in terms of commodities, energies, or, or raw materials, you know, just the whole material infrastructure of Western uh, lifestyle uh, that is partly uh, still in place. So what I want to say with this is, of course, not that it's not uh, a problem that people are losing uh, their livelihoods and their security, uh, but rather that when left politics are voiced in a narrative that promises hope as a direct answer to acknowledging these grievances, then how does that relate to a left politics that would be able to tackle the tensions uh, that would necessarily arise from a systemic reorganization that is necessary? And we'll get back to this problem uh, in the next points too. So the second point I wanted to highlight is uh, this issue of the disillusioned middle classes as the voice of left politics. Um, of course, there is a lot of discussion about the issue of labor, a lot of discussion about the necessity of labor organization. And of course, there are uh, lots of working people participating in the mobilizations uh, and the, the element of black labor has uh, just been uh, highlighted, which, which is really important. But still, despite of that, in invoicing programs uh, for left politics. So far, middle uh, class voices have been dominating the debate. And I also think that's one of the aspects why the black labor element has been toned down uh, in the way uh, the Black Lives Matter uh, has been connected to the project of democratic socialism. Um, and in this uh, tradition of uh, uh, Marxist critique uh, that many of us are referring to, uh, this problem of, of middle classes in left politics has been recurrently addressed. And it has been addressed in relation to its specific intermediate or contradictory position in, in the capital labor relation. Uh, in the world system tradition, uh, they have been described as junior partners in hegemonic re regimes of accumulation. Uh, where junior partner means that they are not uh, the most well off, but uh, they still benefit enough uh, to support those regimes. And what happens in the, with these positions in terms of uh, times of crisis is that they get alienated from earlier elite alliances. At this point, there are uh, disillusioned uh, because those alliances don't deliver anymore. And they look for alternative coalitions. And these can, of course, go for elite exclusionary coalitions in more in the fascist direction, or they can uh, go for uh, social alliances. And in the latter case, uh, this delusionment uh, can work as an anti-systemic energy at the moment of the mobilization. But in terms of the next step. Uh, Hi, Agnes. Yes. Just can you speak a little louder for our, our uh, recording, please? I will try. OK. Thank you. So in terms of the next step, uh, it's important that these, these middle class positions uh, that we're speaking about today, they are very much rooted in knowledge monopolies that are based on the extraction and alienation of knowledge and organizational capacities from the whole social body uh, that has been done through a capitalist organization that provided them those positions in the first place. And <laughs> being based in these positions, uh, they are interested in maintaining and expanding them. Uh, and in the moment already, in the moment of anti-systemic mobilization, this pushes middle-class left political imaginaries towards uh, thinking about and proposing expert solutions that they would uh, deliver, uh, which are framed uh, in terms of the general good. But in the next step, after coming to power, this interest to maintain and expand those positions uh, directly collides with labor's interest. Now, of course, this is a very uh, simplistic summary, but 
what I wanted to say with this is that you cannot take middle class indignation as an unambiguously anti systemic force, even in the moment when it speaks that language. Uh, those of us who are this, I am this too. As we speak of labor, we're also silently interested in something else because of our uh, systemic positions. And this silent tendency has to be tackled in uh, left strategy. Um, and going on to my third point, uh, it's about what it means to be in power. Uh, and in line with what uh, so many people mentioned before me, uh, in the Marxist tradition, it is always emphasized that the state is the part of total capitalist relations. It's not their independent regulator. Uh, and it is the recurring experience of uh, left political movements that entering state power uh, also means that you find yourself in the management seat of global capitalist integration. And any disturbance in that integration uh, is going to have sharp social consequences because of the whole society's integration into capitalist circuits. And that will cause social tension, which will question your uh, legitimacy as a left government. So as soon as you become a left government, you find yourself in an ambiguous interest position between for forwarding an anti-systemic goal and maintaining a global capitalist integration in order to be able to stay in power. Uh, and this raises the question, you know, how leftist politics, political strategy can prepare for that. Uh, and it seems to me that as long as there is this narrative of providing uh, hope, uh, uh, a socialist green revival, even this, when uh, the concept of social, uh, disaster socialism seems to uh, maintain this uh, idea that um, if there is a socialist government, it can only get better. But this sort of contradicts with, with the recurrent experience of uh, anti-capitalist uh, uh, efforts that any attempt to uh, pursue anti-capitalist transformation would necessarily result in tensions, if not for other reason than because of capitalist backlash. So there is a need to uh, strategically build social alliances that can bear through those tensions and maintain an anti-systemic direction, even when the not so beneficial effects of, uh, of a left uh, governance uh, come to the fore. And I agree with uh, those panelists before me who have emphasized that in building uh, this kind of capacity, this kind of power, uh, along movements and state-oriented politics, it is of key importance to organize within the economy, uh, both in the terms to, to build a power base within capitalist structures that can pose a threat to the circulation of value in terms of resistance, but also in terms of building alternative uh, reproductive resources, organization and expertise background for substantive change. Uh, and as someone who have been working more on this side, uh, also because of, uh, you know, the hegemony of the uh, Western democratic socialist uh, state-oriented project during the Sanders and the Corbyn campaign, uh, there's this experience that you are sneered at uh, as doing something irrelevant, as if you wouldn't know what politics is. But the, the way I see it is that um, this element of the strategy is not in conflict at all with the state-oriented aspects of politics. Uh, it rather gives them the substantive weight. Uh, it is the role of the Soviets in the revolutionary strategy uh, that would look at the totality of capitalist relations as the sphere of struggle. And then my fourth point is um, about the global transformation of the crisis context, uh, it seems to me that there are some aspects of it, uh, that the non-Western aspects of it, that seem to be under-conceptualized uh, in Western debates. And, and this is mainly that the crisis of Western core economies uh, corresponds to the rise of China and its global hegemonic project. And this is not something that is just out there that you can uh, continue to speak about 
capitalist crisis in terms of the decline of Western inst capitalist institutions and uh, just sometimes mentioned China as something that is also there. This is a conceptual question because it is the same crisis process. Uh, for instance, uh, there are these <clears throat> phenomena uh, and the relative concepts uh, of uh, financialization or deindustrialization. Uh, all this uh, impression uh, that everything uh, is literally melting into air as capital leaves the uh, structures of the real economy. Uh, this is the Western part of the story. But meanwhile, uh, the same capital is also coming back to the ground in these immense, immense investments into infrastructure of mega projects, uh, new extractive and manufacturing industries uh, within the Chinese globalization project. And I also see this uh, on the ideological level. Uh, it seems to me like in the West, uh, also for the left, uh, this present crisis is so much uh, conceived as a decline, uh, as if it would be, the crisis would be the end of the world. Uh, we cannot imagine the future. It is as if even progress uh, would be, even for progress, it would need to search uh, in the past. Uh, and this exists simultaneously uh, with this super strong push of an ideology of a new type of growth uh, within the Chinese project which is not only an ideology, but it's also a social experience of millions of people that uh, their space of mobility is, is growing, of course, uh, which goes together also with uh, associated interests of excluding and suppressing other people. Um, so I think it's really important not to allow uh, the thought about uh, democratic socialism to be closed within the global imaginary of a declining Western empire. Uh, because for anti-systemic uh, thought, you need to see the dynamics of the same system. So in this case, we need to see the crisis also as a space where a new project for capitalist, capitalist growth is rising, by which I don't mean that uh, it will necessarily rise. Uh, we don't know. Uh, we have the climate crisis and everything. Uh, but the present situation is this. And, uh, I would close with uh, just three uh, practical uh, consequences of this last uh, point. Um, one of them is the relation between geopolitical conflict that rises from this uh, tensions of uh, hegemonic transition and its effect on left politics at home. Um, it seems to me that as long as the, the promise of the left is to compensate uh, for the grievances of global downward mobility, uh, it is so easy uh, for it to, to suddenly associate with uh, domestic capital's uh, interests within a geopolitical conflict. And this has happened or earlier basically overnight uh, with the internationalist workers movement, which was a huge organized body, which we don't have today. Um, so I think this is a threat. Uh, and another uh, practical point is um, considering the massive global cooptation potential of this new growth project uh, in the sense that those effects of the crisis that uh, Western left political thought uh, still often considers as something that will necessarily push uh, anti-systemic uh, political options. They are very quickly uh, integrated or translated or silenced within uh, uh, the new growth project. And um, you know, we can speak of uh, all the optimism generated by Chinese investments in uh, Africa or increasingly in Eastern Europe too. Um, or, or, you know, uh, climate related issues, how they are translated into elements of a new growth project that is adapting to the uh, new climate circumstances. So this is another point. And my last point is um, that because of this situation, 
the spheres of conflict and resistance uh, are globally reorganizing. Uh, to give one example, the, this new real economy investment wave, it is also a new wave of global employment uh, along polarizing uh, value chains. Uh, so it means that uh, this, this new uh, wave of integrating and moving around globally the workforce and also increasingly divide it and control it along uh, status-based categories, which are also, you know, a, a new and a bit different uh, way of uh, racialized and ethnicized and uh, gender-based divisions. So <clears throat> you might ask, how the capital labor conflict is organized globally around these chains and how this question relates to uh, the idea of left politics as a relationship between demonstrations on the street and local state politics. And of course, what I want to say with this is um, that this project of uh, thinking that the revolutionary strategy is a combination of, of the Soviets and uh, political organization, it needs to produce it, its own internationalist dimension. The dimension of, of the anti-systemic struggle is not uh, given by itself. Um, we don't even have an anti-systemic imaginary of the global present, what is happening now. Uh, Obviously, we don't even have a real infrastructure where that uh, social imaginary could circulate. Uh, we have various levels uh, and networks of uh, bourgeois media. We have uh, middle-class social media activist spaces. And then we have this uh, new uh, global communication uh, mega project uh, on global imagination. Uh, that is uh, done as part of the Belt and Road Initiative project. So just to close down and uh, bring this back to the to the debate on uh, on politics or, or state oriented politics, uh, it seems to me that the idea that politics are expressing uh, that politics are about expressing claims in public space and then going for elections. This idea was too readily taken over from bourgeois concepts of politics in new left strategy. Uh, and it has to be reconsidered uh, along with the older left insights uh, that said that state politics and uh, public space are not this general uh, free uh, space for uh, political deliberation, but they are constituted within capitalist relations as their specific forms of institutionalization. And on the side of labor, it is a organization that can build out and produce the space for communication and politics. It is not given by uh, existing uh, uh, institutions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Agnes. Again, I'm over here taking a lot of notes, so I hope uh, those watching are very full as well. So again, chat, please drop comments, ideas, uh, feedback, etc. in the chat, and please post questions in the Q&A section. We are getting ready to go to our last speaker, and then we'll go to um, a Q&A session. So our final speaker in this panel is Francis Fox Piven. Francis is a professor of political science and sociology at the Graduate Center of CUNY. Francis is known equally for her contributions to social theory and for her social activism. A veteran on the war of poverty, war on poverty, and subsequent welfare rights protests, both in New York City and on the national stage, she has been instrumental in formulating the theoretical underpinnings of those movements. Over the course of her career, she has also held offices in several social and professional organizations, including the American Civil Liberties Union, ACLU, the American Political Science Association, and the Society for the Study of Social Problems. So we will pass it over to you now, Francis. Thank you very much. Glad to talk to you. 
I want to, in my, in my comments, to concentrate on the American left and its prospects in the coming years. I would justify this by pointing out what everybody knows, which is that the United States is the center, the capital of global capitalism. And what happens in the United States has overwhelming meaning for the left elsewhere. Now, at this particular moment, just a few days after the attack on the Capitol building in Washington, DC, I think almost everybody's sense in the United States, but especially the sense of the left is that we are in a moment of great danger. What we have gotten a glimpse of uh, in the demonstrations in Washington, but also in the bravado, in the carrying on of the president of the United States and his cronies is the prospects of American fascism. And it's a fascism without a fascist party, excepting insofar as the police, the numerous police agencies in the United States are connected and operate in a sense together, almost like a party. But overwhelmingly, I think people on the left sense the dangers for the left in this, in this political climate. Now, I, I think that that's true. I agree with that. We all believe it. We all tremble a little at the possibilities of street action, for example, uh, violence in the streets. And yet I think the situation is more complicated and not quite as grim as that picture, as that picture suggests. And I want to begin to explain what I mean by going back to a kind of old conundrum on the left, which has to do with the relationship between movement politics and electoral politics. The old view, the view in which I sort of grew up to inherit, was that movement politics and electoral politics were antithetical, that if people believed in movements, they didn't do electoral politics. And if people did electoral politics, they drained the energy of movements. However, in the last five to 10 years in the United States, that view has receded and it's been superseded by a kind of remarkable set of developments in which left groups, democratic socialists in particular, have emerged to batter the Democratic Party, to, to try to take over that party, to take it over, especially on the lower levels of political office, and with considerable success. I regarded this, and I still regard it, as a very encouraging development. However, the events of the Trump presidency and the rampaging in the Capitol building create a kind of paralysis, I think, of the dangers, uh, the dangers really of movement politics, even a movement politics that is chastened at, but by its connection with electoral politics. So that's, that's really the question I want to address. What are the prospects for movement politics and electoral politics working in a complementary way in the United States at this moment in time? I agree that there are dangers in street action and mob action, but at the same time, I think that this is an extraordinary moment 
for the rise of movement politics, for a kind of a stronger, more effective, more definitive kind of movement politics. And I, which would take care, would take advantage of opportunities that we have been ignoring. So let me try to explain that. The recent developments in worldwide global capitalism have, I think, completely changed the context in which movements operate. Never before has have economic relationships and communication relationships been as intertwined and as fragile as they are today. Now, in order to understand why this is so important for movements, you have to go back to the question, what do movements do? Why do they make a difference in their societies? And much of the time when we talk about movements, we talk about sort of the noise that movements create. Movements march, they have banners, they sing, uh, they create a ruckus. But that movements do have a kind of capacity for communication, which is important, but that is not the most important thing that movements do. What movements do is they spur the withdrawal of people from the cooperative networks that constitute society, economic networks and social networks. And the, this kind of withdrawal or refusal, this kind of strike action is much more effective in a society where economic and social relations are complex, uh, uh, extend over wide distances and uh, are disciplined by just-in-time production as is true in most Western countries today. So on the one hand, there's a kind of fear, paralysis of the left because of the menace of the violent mobs that we have seen in Washington, D.C. and in the state capitals of the United States. On the other hand, I think never have the, has the context for movement effectiveness been as clear as it is today in the United States. Uh, and we haven't really studied this. We haven't explored it. We haven't focused on it. Rather, we focus on the bravado, the bullying of the right, on the crowds and so forth, but it is strike action writ large, which is the great prospect for movement strength, movement politics that can also take advantage of the electoral uh, gains that have been made through the Democratic Party uh, in the last few years. So I think there's a lot of work that has to be done and it's work that also should be done by intellectuals, by academics, revealing the interconnections, the complex and fragile uh, chains of production, chains of communication, which will make, which make movements more and more effective. So, it's a scary time, uh, but it's also a time when we can imagine at least a left that is much more effective and powerful than the left has been for a long time. Thank you. Such a powerful panel. Now we're going to transition into the question and answer section. Uh, for the rest of our time together. So right now I wanna also, um, this is a time where 
uh, current panelists can ask or invite questions of one another. I've also done some reviewing of what was raised in the chat and the Q&A section, and I'll incorporate some of the, that thinking here. And then also for other panelists of other um, sections, I see if you wanna turn on your camera and participate um, in this section, please uh, turn your camera on so we can, uh, so we can also have that, um, have that interaction. And I actually wanna start the questions where Francis, you begin to leave off, which is to say that yes, this may be a, st a scary time, but this is a time of reimagining. And I think all of the panelists here today talked about an emergence in some way or another of a new left, of a reconfiguration, of an opening, um, of an opportunity to build and to do something different. And so I wanna push that question back to you all, panelists, to go a bit deeper with us and tell us about this new left formation, this new leftist power building um, that might be happening. And I will push it uh, to Gonzalo. I see you're on camera. Sí, lo, Mira, lo, thank you. Bueno, como dije en mi presentación, As I mentioned in my presentation, es que la nueva izquierda, primero que no se fabrica sobre nada, se fabrica sobre una estructura is that eh, social compleja y sobre una estructura de la izquierda también. In Entonces, al mismo tiempo que vemos esos nuevos, eh, esos nuevos líderes, It's mujeres, hombres, leaders, eh, con women, otras eh, men, definiciones, siendo incorporados eh, fuertemente desde la base eh, a, la, a, a la lucha política, eh, la, la gran, el gran dilema que tenemos ahora es cómo eso va a dialogar is how this new trend eh, is going to eh, dialogue with the existing PT political infrastructure of PT, the Catholic Church, eh, etc. across time. I think that's eh, our eh, main challenge. Que, eh, un enorme, At the same todo, time, eh, para el propio, eh, we have, aquí, no, para el PT, of course, this implies eh, a Brasil, challenge for the PT. It cierta, became accustomed to de, 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 de a certain political control eh, in que, the left. Eh, que la, la and it is now pueblo, in the population ese, and the people are now control, defying eh, that y, control. Y si no If PT doesn't have the sufficient eh, intelligence realidad, to eh, adopt to a new reality, en, it's en, going to be completely sidelined. So those are the experiences and challenges of PT. And of course we have new lefts and new leaders. Pero el socialismo son personas, son líderes, son luchas is, concretas. Eh, eso es lo que está emergiendo aquí con muchas people, fuerzas. Faces, eh, names, que, ideas, como dije antes, es muy lindo de entonces, y de participar y de apoyar y de ayudar. And those are the ones eh, that we have to support entonces, en sentido, and share yo, and exchange. In that sense, al, I am optimistic. Durante los últimos cuatro o cinco años fue muy in the past, ver, the last four eh, to five years have been extremely difficult. El, el, to be honest, it's been caos, difficult to no, see no, la, la, a light eh, in this, eh, not chaos, eh, but loca, in the así, insane la, advancement, la izquierda, the irrational de derecha, advancement de of the ultra-right of Bolsonaro. Que, eh, Now, hay señales we see de, de strong signals de of reconstruction and resilience, positive resilience of these new political projects. Thank you. Francis, would you like to build on your ideas of what the new left might be? I think the new left is going to be a dispersed left. I, uh, I th it's not going to be just the working class but it's going to be people finding their opportunities to withdraw cooperation in different settings. Now, historically, uh, the, the sort of celebration of the working class often focused on groups of workers who had a kind of logistical power because of where they were located. They worked in the ports, for example, 
or they worked in communications. We have to begin to identify those people who have that kind of logistical power of shutting things down because of where they're located in a complex uh, system of extended chains of production, of complex communications. Uh, but those workers are not going to be just port workers or transportation workers or communications workers. Uh, I always like to give the example of domestic workers, you know, in, uh, in the big cities of the West today, uh, the workers include women in managerial positions who depend every day on a nanny showing up at their door to take care of the kids or to cook the dinner. Uh, those nannies also have strike power. We have to begin to expose the strike power of many different kinds of people who perform functions in a densely integrated cooperative society and figure out how to strike and to protect the strike power, to defend the strike power so that it is not crushed by armed force, which of course, uh, is in a way what we, what we see a lot of today. Thank you. And I see Mabel that you've dropped a question here in the chat. Would you mind coming off of mute to directly ask your question to Agnes? Sí, sí, te escuchamos. Sí, mi pregunta es para, yes, para Agnes. Este, me pareció muy, muy interesante is for su Agnes. intervención. I thought it was a very interesting intervention. Um, she talks about más, the middle classes más amplio que las clases medias, and es beyond the middle classes, la dimensión del consumo the importance of thinking de about global consumption in this stage of global de, capitalism. De um, everything from mass media, which has a strong international component that conditions autonomous politics, um, so we see struggles that seek to break uh, with that consumerism. If there are any reflections to that regard, but in general, we really share a common viewpoint. Yes, definitely. Uh, I even planned to speak about it, but then cut it because of time, how um, the industrialization of social imagination and all the new technical developments about it uh, these days, how they are so closely married to the patterns of, of fetishized uh, commodities that make up our world and they make up our understanding our, uh, of our place within the world. Um, you know, when doing social research, you speak to people about their uh, identity, they, their their place uh, in society, and uh, uh, it is experienced in the in the form of uh, commodities, and it is expressed in the form of commodities. Right? What kind of homes? What kind of cars? What kind of uh, whatever? And how do you get from here? To, to what uh, Francis said, which I think is, is yes, that is the, the basic thing to start with, the capacity to withdraw cooperation. Uh, but that also means that then you have to be capable to, to live in a different way, which has dimensions of power and, you know, having just be able to produce the basic resources of, uh, of survival, but also having the, the collective political imagination that, that allows you to do that and just uh, give the rest up. <coughs> Thank you, I think, oh, I see Hillary saying, sure, come off mute, Hillary. I was really impressed by all the talks and I suppose I wanted to ask a question which links Francis's proposition really, strategic proposition with Agnes's um, arguments. and. Um, and links a bit to what Gonzalo says too, which is that I really agree and want to agree with what Francis has said. Um, so there's withdrawal, but then as, as, and I can see how important that is, and it's not just about the traditional working class. I mean, 
it's clear, it's been clear through the pandemic, but obviously the, um, what's called the precariat, I mean, the sort of platform capitalism workers who are often mainly black women, you know, who, who, who are, but who are getting organized, like in, certainly in the UK, um, often through independent unions, uh, the workers for Deliveroo, and a lot of the kind of key, um, key sort of logistical links in that just-in-time system um, are getting organized. Um, but then there's the question of how that withdrawal can be sustained um, not just against repression, which is one thing, but also um, against, if you like, economic repression. I mean, how it, how people can survive um, in the process of withdrawal. And I wonder whether there there's also another trend. I don't know if it's a trend. I'm always wary of being a bit too optimistic because it's my sort of character. But um, which and you've seen it in the in the. Um, it, two things during the um, pandemic, which I mentioned yesterday, but maybe relevant now. One is the sort of impetus towards a kind of new type of solidarity economy, new kinds of communal food, communal kind of sharing. And I don't know how systematic it, it is, but maybe one role of the of left activists needs to be to direct... Um, their energies towards making it systematic. And maybe also it needs a reconfiguring of the old institutions. So clearly trade unions and, and left parties could do a lot more um, if they saw themselves as being resources for that, for both supporting the withdrawal, but also for developing alternatives. Um, and then the other thing is this sort of idea that the unions have been shaken by, well, by the defeats, but also now by the the loss of jobs and the effects of the pandemic. And whether one out of that sort of disaster, as it were, one could see them rethinking their role. So they become agents of, um, of an alternative economy, um, sort of in civil society. I mean, I, I'm not denying the importance of the state, but obviously, we've learnt in Britain and also in the US that, that a movement, an electoral movement, isn't enough. I think, um, well, several speakers have stressed this, and I was reading an article today which stressed the, the lessons of the Corbyn movement, was that there was a populism of, of communication, but not a populism of, of material organisation. And so um, it seems we need to think of how to reconfigure the left both to support the kind of withdrawal project that you're talking about, but also to support the the sort of alternative social relations project I, that Agnes is talking about. Can I talk? Of course. Uh, I, I think there have been very important moves by some unions in exactly that direction, particularly teachers unions in the United States. And, uh, less dramatically uh, by nurses unions. Uh, and the slogan that describes what they're trying to do is bargaining for the common good. When the teachers went out on strike in Chicago, they prepared the way for their strike by doing a lot of organizing in the communities where they taught in the schools and by also preparing lunches for the kids uh, to tide them over during the strike because a lot of children in the United States in cities particularly uh, get much of their nutrition from school lunches uh, and school breakfasts. So I, I, th I think people have been exploring this and can be done a lot more. And it, it can be a kind of cooperative endeavor in which all kinds of people are pulled in to the great strike movement. Yeah, I'm looking at the rest of the panelists. Does anybody wanna respond to that or to build on that? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> I could definitely build on that. Um, just, just to add this, that um, 
I think the way the trade union for en trade unions for energy democracy alliance uh, put this is very much clear and to the point when they speak about the role of unions in uh, building social power for uh, just transition, um, where they say that you need to use the, the, the this logistical power uh, of the unions that Francis spoke about, that you are in a position to, to stop uh, uh, capitalist circulation and, and, and gain some bargaining power through that. You need to use that to push for transformation and also to build uh, power to help movement alliances and solidarity economy alliances uh, that can uh, be the, the people-owned uh, wing of that transformation. Uh, and uh, there was another uh, question uh, in the Q&A that, that links here, which says that um, if the left uh, promising hope is uh, not enough, then, uh, then how do the solidarity economy uh, come in here? Um, I just wanted to <clears throat> point out this uh, really good publication. It's one of the working papers published by Tued uh, that I think shows this direction of thought uh, in a brilliant way. And it's about, it's an uh, uh, industrialist uh, union uh, paper from India on how to think uh, industrialization in India as an emancipative project uh, that is also a climate transition project, which means that you need to uh, shut down emissions uh, maximally, uh, but you also need to industrialize and develop because you don't want people to live without electricity forever in the poor regions, right? Uh, and, and what does this mean in terms of, you know, uh, reorganizing the priorities and the technology uh, of, of what development is what this means in terms of you know how India is embedded in the global value chains of, of producing solar panels and paying for them, uh, you know how, how uh, anti-debt policy and uh, uh, anti-intellectual uh, property uh, policy has to be part of this kind of a, a, an emancipative uh, and climate-based industrialization project uh, of of a, a movement unionist uh, strategy. And they also say that uh, as industrialist, industrialization of policy, uh, this is emancipative in as much it has enough movement power that can uh, put it into state practice and can maintain it there when all the pressures against it uh, from the you know, uh, global and local organizations of uh, of the present system uh, are going to arrive. And I just put the, put this here, the link to this paper in the Q&A. Oh, so well, um, I, I think that the, the notion of class shouldn't work as an obstacle indeed to, to think on the emancipatory forces or social forces. Uh, I, I don't. I don't. I don't think it's a good idea to get stuck to 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 the to the classical notion of class, because the classical notion of class is really uh, something that is changing. Uh, and the, the 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 structure of capitalism has changed and is in the in the in a transformation, and we don't know exactly what the what uh, how the the class. <clears throat> Good luck in the future. And in the in the meantime, we have a lot of, of emergency of new emancipatory struggles and the struggle for other kind of justice and, and very leftist and radical and that are that are uh, being more uh, protagonists of, of 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 the struggle. So we have to be very sensitive. And I I, I and I'm I guess I I, I guess that we have to be open uh, to that kind of uh, of new expressions, and uh, considering that part, those all those part of 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 a, of a class plus uh, analysis. Because if not, we will we will keep reduced to 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 these um, analytical categories that that doesn't really help us in uh, in organizing what is uh, emerging as, as social movements, as as emancipatory struggles, and so on. So. so uh, I guess that that's the case of Brazil. It's a clear example of that. And I guess that uh, that's also the case of the US uh, following what Francis uh, has said. So that's my idea. Thank you.
Great. So are there other panelists who want to continue to build uh, this? I know I have a list of questions um, and we could be here all day with me just asking uh, my own personal questions, but I am wondering if there are others who want to who want to submit. There's a question here, I think, for you, Gonzalo, in the chat. I think it says, I'm trying to translate it. I think it says, Gonzalo, when uh, you are speaking about the change in the structure of capitalism, and we are talking about a perception of the reconstruction of capitalism or a bifurcation that we are able, uh, it's in Spanish, maybe if you want to read it, yeah. Let me just take a look at that, Gonzalo. When the change of the structure of capitalism, we're talking about a perception of the reconstruction of capital o de una bifurcación que puede dar al, al traste con el nuevo orden mundial. I I don't I'm I make an analysis from from our side, from the side of the social movement and the struggle. So eh, and we have to we have to to analyze uh, what's going what's really going on this side eh, because eh, when I was uh, invited to the panel I said well what, what is the vision of the social movement and then when you see at the social movement the social movements are different and not and not necessarily answering to the to the transformation of the capitalist system as, it, as it's happening. Eh? My feeling is that the, the, the capital system is really on a on a acute transformation, but what is uh, to be born in terms of social struggle and so on and so forth, eh, and, and, and class is not yet so clear. Eh? And it's not yet condensed. Uh, you, we have the, the precariat as a, as a category. We have all the new uh, uh, single entrepreneurs, uh, all splitted. Uh, and I don't know how, how and when this will be condensed or this will become as a, as a paracy uh, class. Um, for us. So we have to be patient. And in the meantime, there are other other. Uh, vibrant struggles for rights and for justice and so that are kind of uh, the, the vanguard of 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 of, uh, of the left and we have to be respectful of them of that and and, and help in the, in developing the, those while waiting uh, the, the the consolidation of another uh, structure um, in the more classic uh, perspective of class uh, but this is what is uh, urgent, what is vibrant, eh, eh, and what is uh, authentic in a way. Eh? And, and, and I'm happy to, to join to help uh, in, the develop, in the developing of, uh, of that. At the same time that we, of course, eh, we, we develop some, and this is also, uh, I can make an, an ad, eh, uh, a, a structural conflict, uh, a struggle uh, in, in what, what I can call the classic, uh, division uh, of the world uh, uh, against big, big economic powers and so on and so forth in, in, in the dispute of the geopolitics or the global governance and so on and so forth. So uh, I, that they are kind of simultaneous uh, struggles, but for sure in the, on the ground, the ones I mentioned, at least here in Brazil and, and, and some other uh, uh, countries are the more vibrant. Eh? are the more bourbon. So in that sense, um, we have a kind of different uh, tracks and speeds, uh, but those who are going fast and, and bolder are the ones I mentioned before and, and the ones that are real being uh, in the core of, 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 a new, of new hopes uh, here in Brazil, in the US and, and so on and so forth. That makes sense to me. I was actually just gonna ask you to, to weigh more in on that, uh, Francis. So I'm glad you just spoke up. Well, it makes sense to think that you can't plot out in advance using social science surveys or whatever, uh, either the directions of contemporary capitalism or the vulnerabilities of contemporary capitalism and our capacity to tap those vulnerabilities, to widen them, to dig into them. Uh, we have to do it by trial and error, but that's trial and error has been the method of movements from time immemorial. Uh, movements have never had the benefit 
uh, a dissertation on the subject that can direct them to do what they have to do. So I, I, I regard Gonzalez's comments as uh, a call for trial and error disruption, trial and error protest. I'm for that. Uh, and Gonzalo gives you the power fist. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. So there's a comment here, uh, I think by Tom and the general question being, what kind of transnational solidarity and coordination tools we need in this moment between this new kind of movements named by you all, especially thinking about the past experiences of global coordination of social movements and the left. Is that for me? <laughs> yes, yeah, you and whoever else. Oh, come on, I will answer all. <laughs> But it's okay, it's okay. Yeah, because I'm part of that. I guess that there is no clear how the connection between these new struggles for, for in, in the case of the, the, the black, uh, the Negroes thing is, is done. Uh, uh, the women's solidarity is maybe, maybe more uh, stabilized and so, but there is real uh, a kind of a, 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 a not so well developed uh, internationalism in, in that regard. And that's super clear. What we have uh, as internationalism from my point of view is the old, the old ways of, uh, the, the remaining would say ways of anti-globalization uh, things that are transformed. I, I feel identified with that. I feel kind of a son of that. Uh, we, we still, uh, fight against corporate power and, and, and transnational corporation in the global economy. We question the, 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 the what's going on in the global value change uh, and the, the, how the corporations dodge uh, the laws and violate human rights and so on and so forth. So at that level, I guess that it's kind of organized still, uh, but there are many other dimensions of the social struggles yeah, uh, that need to be coordinated. I, my feeling is that a new internationalism will emerge because those national struggles need to, need to be connected, really. Yeah, uh, and my idea is that we, that we have a global network and global uh, activists and we, we know people from one place to another have an important role to play. Yeah, there is bring in that people, put that people, the young activists, the new activists, or the activists in different uh, sectors in dialogue uh, to nurture uh, uh, something that could, uh, could provide new basis for a new internationalism. That's my, my, my idea. Well, there is so much more international communication than there was in the past. People hear, they watch, and they see what happens and they themselves figure out the relevance of an action in the Middle East to their own situation. I think that that has been happening already. Not a reason not to encourage it. We should encourage it, we should facilitate it, we should communicate uh, with uh, about what's going on elsewhere in the world. But give people credit for being able to see and to learn. Yeah, I completely agree with that. The thing is that it's different from what it was before. Before the internationalism was a, an organized, let's say internationalism. And this new internationalism is still not organized. Maybe it won't be organized or maybe it will organize in a more, uh, <laughs> It's a different kind of organization. Yeah, 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 exactly, exactly. So that's a, that's a also interesting and vibrant. could be super vibrant, of course. Yeah, but um, yeah, maybe our, our eyes and our categories are not ready to understand that there is something new there. We cannot say that. Um, maybe it's that. And, and, and in that sense, I, I agree. I fully agree with you. There are kind of waves uh, of, of mobilization uh, but what called our attention is that those waves of mobilization, new mobilization, 
and not uh, are connected in another way. And, and, in, uh, and we as classic internationalists, let's say, have difficulties in identifying and see clearly how, how this uh, evolves. Who has the dog that is barking? Yours? Oh. <laughs> so I, I see, uh, oh, Daniel's comment. Okay, so uh, we'll just deal with uh, sort of one last, maybe one last round of comments from the panelists to close us out. And so I invite you to either share um, your wildest freedom dreams. I evoke the term freedom dreams given to me by Robin D.G. Kelly, who is um, a black leftist, who is, um, has certainly ignited much of my deep black commie, black socialist uh, freedom dream thinking. So um, I would invite you all to, uh, to, to leave us with either your biggest, deepest freedom dream, um, or even leave us with the scheme, right? So we've done some of that plotting here today. Um, and so I'll just start in the order of the, uh, yeah, in the order of people's give, people giving their presentations. So we'll start with you, uh, Gonzalo, and then close out with you, uh, Francis. I've been talking so much. I, I just want to, to thank you. And I said that I'm, 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 I'm optimistic of, of both the, the, the struggles we develop at the international level and the struggles we are developing here in Brazil. Um, and yeah, it's weird to, to say, well, this guy is optimistic in, a, in, a, in, a, in the Bolsonaro's, <laughs> in the Bolsonaro's country and so on and so forth. But yes, I have, I'm very optimistic indeed because I can see now uh, new developments from our side that are very that are that are real uh, that gives me a hope eh? and I'm fully enthusiastic in, in contributing in helping um, and and so on and so forth. It will take a lot of time, eh? but yes, you know how these struggles are. You start, you start, you contribute, you win this here, you lose here, but I guess that. This is the right, the right uh, way, and and it's uh, it's it's uh, yeah. I fully uh, believe in this, and and, and I hope it. at the international level maybe it's uh, harder eh, because the, it's a lot of geopolitics too, uh, and, and so uh, and in that in that in that level we are just denouncing the problems. We are not uh, illuminating, let's say. <laughs> Uh, the solution. So there is a, a longer, a longer road to to uh, to go. Thank you, and thank you to all the panelists. It was, has been a great pleasure. Thank you, Agnes. Bring an example for this internationalization. Uh, how it can happen, you know, in real life. Um, from Eastern Europe, which is not much, you know, not that much in the center of the events, but uh, that's where I'm uh, based. Um, so, you know, since the fall of socialism uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, all countries have been mostly dominated by this ideology of capitalist development, finally socialism is over, we have to catch up with the West and so on. And uh, the idea about each other was that we need to compete with each other on this slope towards uh, the uh, superior Western models. And um, when a new left perspectives, you know, when the new generation started to develop them, uh, of course, the idea was that, no, wait, we have to speak to each other and see uh, what is happening to all of us under this idea of uh, mutual competition. Uh, and those collaborations uh, have been going on for a few years already. Uh, and one of the issues, uh, you know, the, the concrete issues that people are dealing with is um, this reindustrialization of Eastern Europe these days. Because there was this massive uh, deindustrialization when they killed the socialist industry, and then some uh, Western lower-level uh, industries came in. Uh, but now there is huge reindustrialization that is driven from both levels. So you know, Western companies are putting uh, their uh, their uh, units uh, for cheaper labor, 
And meanwhile, uh, Eastern uh, companies are coming uh, because this is, you know, their their first entry point to Eastern Europe and they, uh, to Europe, and they can also use uh, Eastern Europe cheaper labor force. So there's this huge reindustrialization everywhere, which is communicated by leaders and uh, everyone as you know this new uh, possibility for development. Uh, and we started to speak about how, what happens with workers. And interestingly, what happens with workers is that um, they are distributed uh, and very, you know, in a very fragmented, uh, differentiated way uh, along these value chains. And, and just to give you an example, so you would have uh, the Chinese company that is kicked out of China uh, because it's a, a rubber tire company. And because of their uh, new climate uh, regulations, they don't do uh, rubber manufacturing at home. They put it into Serbia. Uh, and they have Chinese uh, workers and so-called Serbian workers, most of whom are various uh, levels of migrants from uh, post Yugoslavia with various levels of rights that they can have uh, because of you know these different citizenships and different uh, inter-country contacts and uh, what they produce there goes to Volkswagen which is uh, the German company that works in Hungary with subordinated Hungarian workforce but also within the Hungarian workforce you have this uh, a uh, very intricate system of hierarchy uh, of those who are uh, locals, those who are internal migrants and come through uh, labor uh, mediation companies, uh, those who are migrants from within the EU, those who are migrants from Ukraine and so on. So we can see, you know, how from the perspective of labor, this uh, reindustrialization is, is, you know, how they are sucking people up into this very hierarchical machine that on the top produces uh, profits, but <coughs> but people experience it as, uh, how to say, you don't experience yourself as part of labor that is, uh, uh, that is used here. You experience yourself as part of a very small fragment as you, and your problem is the other fragment, with the other fragment of labor. And this is very ethnicized because in Eastern Europe, you have lots of ethnicities and lots of conflicts, also inter-country ethnicities, inter-country conflicts and so on. So uh, one of the projects uh, would be to, to show this whole process from their perspective, you know, so, so there is at least an imagination of how this uh, transformation of the local economies, what it is in fact, uh, the way how these two big fragments of global capital are sucking up Eastern European uh, labor uh, today. And, and to be able to, to think about uh, these different labor positions as, as, as part of the same, uh, as having the same interest. Thank you. And then Francis, if you wanna just quickly close this out. You know, it really doesn't matter whether you feel optimistic or pessimistic. Uh, the world is changing and we have to be part of that. And we have to try to twist it, nudge it, change it in a way that makes our life better and the lives of other people better. We don't have any choice. So, you know, there's a little bit too much of a sort of, you know, twittering about whether things are going to get better, or blah, 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 blah. we're in it. We can't get out of it. We might as well fight our way to a better world. Thank you. And on that, fighting our way uh, to a better world, I want to thank the panelists um, for this very rich and stimulating discussion. And also remind you all uh, here who've also participated by through your witnessing and asking some important questions. I'd like to remind you that we're re reconvening for day three of the conference tomorrow. If you would like to keep up to date with the latest research and analysis from TNI, please, please, please subscribe to the newsletter. You can see the link to do that on the slide here. And I believe a link should be posted in the chat that you can click on. Once again, Thank you for attending. 
I had a wonderful day and I hope you did too. And I will see you all tomorrow. Love and power. Bye-bye.